Should we look at a team each? Um, yeah, go on then. I'll go City them. today because I always go with the with the team that plays counter attacking. So I'll go with the team that's playing. So you go City, yeah. I'll go Man, uh, Leicester City, and identifying areas of the real game which you can take into under ten coaching. Um, yeah, this is, this is going to be an interesting one. <laughs> aspects in which you can coach or consider when teaching them. Okay. Very rarely. Things we need to, we need to look at, you know, when you look at like very open topics, like something that you can really simplify to, you know, a ten-year-old at the end of the day. And we can say ten-year-olds under tens. We were talking about seven, eight, nine. You can probably establish a conversation with them on very, very basic principles. Yeah, I think predominantly that would be a very technical base. Um. You might be able to identify elements here, which from both teams of the game itself, technical base, and then also basics of tactics as well. So what we can what we can do, what we can do as well is when we stop it, we can literally say how we would explain it to a ten year old, or what what words we would use, or what wording we could, we would use to to try and explain what we're trying to explain from a complex point saying from an ana analytic point of view, and then how would we put it into words for a 10-year-old? Ten, a that would be quite interesting. That, that's definitely don't dive in. <laughs> Say that part again. <laughs> that one's definitely don't dive in. <laughs> but still, I don't think, I, I mean, sometimes we think like dive in. It's not, it's not always understood. I don't think like... Um, it's an easy one to understand because dive in and actually kind of like stop before you get to a tackle. I'm not sure if it's too clear, to be honest with you. Like, yeah, do you know what? I think it's different. commonly a statement made when somebody's probably already made the mistake. Um, oh, you shouldn't have dived in there or why did you dive in? There's other times, admittedly, where a coach might say or a player might say to another player, don't dive in knowing that the opponent, opposing player is quick or able to get away or scenario based in terms of we don't want to make fouls but no I think you're right I think generically it needs to be tidied up into oh it's a goal love it so set pieces wow it's minute two don't dive in or or that can happen <laughs> keep it simple <laughs> there you go but no, oh, what I was trying to say it's dangerous much. It's, one of, it's, a, it's a saying, and we've got plenty of sayings in, in football, and whether it be from a coaching perspective or a fan's perspective. Um, but yeah, don't dive in is an interesting one. I'm even there. Danger zone. That's, that's, that's another, that's another like, bit of wording that, that's used, like different danger zones. Here's more dangerous than other places. Obviously, that free kick close to our goal compared to further up the pitch. So just, just talking about kind of like set pieces and free kicks, where, you know, where free kicks are more dangerous. Um, obviously, we're not looking to concede any free kicks in a, in a game of under 10s, but it could happen. So whereabouts on the pitch are free kicks, kicks more dangerous and where, where on the pitch are free kicks less dangerous? I think you strip it back to a little bit more detail as well. Like Robert Hoof's just... Scored inside the penalty box, and we talk about again another saying of goal side man marking, find your man. And he, despite being marked by his man, he still scored. So, is there an area in under 10s in terms of not just doing it, but educating of like these are the best ways to do it? You know, don't let him run across you, use your arms, um, as an example, or keep your hips in front of you. One, one that I always try and use with, with the younger ages is kind of like try and see the man, get into a position where you can see the man and you can see the ball in almost the same vision. So sometimes this, this saying like, go to a place where you can see the player and see the ball, um, it gets them in a position where they're normally behind the player or between the ball and the goal. Um, and it's, it's just a way that they, they really recognize, okay, can I see the ball? Yes, can I see the player? No, I'm not marking. You know, can I see the player? Yes, but I can't see where the ball is. You know, I'm not in a good position with my body language. So yes. using like different phrases like that, what, what's your take on them? I think 
it's a, it's a good basis to start off. Um, for me, I, 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 I'm, I always want my players, obviously at a more older level, never let somebody run across you. Um, so that would be the, the extra additional information I would give on top of that, where in terms of see where he is, see where the ball is, deny everything in front of you. If he beats you over your head, can you still affect him? But anything in front of you, I'd say the player is liable to stop. Um, and if they, they you go, you go into your age group and the ten's lost, my man. Yeah, but <laughs> if this, this, and if I trip it back, so that's an under 16s. So I trip it back to an under tens. I think it needs to be: Are you in a position where you can simply affect the opponent? You know, in terms of have I got back to become a defender rather than thinking about being an attacker all the time? Because as a ten-year-old, you want the ball, you want to go and attack. But first, can you just develop the fundamental basics of the game? get back, help your team defend, and then add that little bit of detail, like you said, in terms of, yeah, can you see the man? Can you see the ball? And then, like I said, if you're man marking, can you do your duty to, to make it hard for him? It's an interesting That's, that's an interesting one there. Just, just, just obviously seeing Smichael come out there. What some kind of like principles we, we, could, um, we could tell our goalkeepers? Because I don't think a lot of attention is paid to the goalkeepers that, that are playing. So what, what basic ideas do we want them to have as 10-year-olds? Um, you know, maybe from a goal kick perspective, from when to come out, uh, when to stay in the goal, um, try and I mean, catch it. As soon as you mention you know. a goalkeeper and under 10, for me, if you've got the same of coming from crosses, if you've got a goalkeeper brave enough and with the intent to come out and leave his goal, that's, uh, that's something if you don't have installed in you, it, I, t I tend to see players, as they get older, be harder to add that skill. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you had an older player who doesn't like to come for crosses, but if he has always come for crosses, you know, he would have experienced success and failure. Um, so even that slide ball through to Smarkle, the fact that he was urgent to come off his line, if I'm talking to an under 10, I'm thinking... Right, he wants to protect his goal, but at all costs, he wants to help his team. So if he's prepared to come off his line, yes, they'll take risk and he'll concede goals, but there'll be occasions where he's the last man and he sweeps the ball up. But also, if you're under 10, I'd like to think he gets opportunities to play out of goal. Uh, rather than yeah, being, just going to go there. I like that. Rather than solely being restricted to be, be a goalkeeper, what a fantastic pass and what a touch. Oh, But even there, Joe Hart, big and strong, you know, he's... So yeah, sorry, to cut myself short in terms of where, where you, you seem like you, you're a fan of it as well. You know, does he get opportunities to play outfield? It might be every game or once, once a game or once every couple of games. And then when he gets to the ball, if he's not making the save, he's gaining those technical ball skills you know, to take it mm -hmm. in his stride. That's the thing to come out with your feet and come out bravely. You need, to feel, you need to be in a confident and comfortable position with yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. And comfortable with the, with the spaces that are around you. So if you've probably played in that back line, um, or you played in defence, or you've come onto the field, and you're just more comfortable being in different areas of the pitch, being that last man maybe as a defender as well. I think you know a lot of it relates to understanding just distance and, and different areas on the pitch. So if you've never lived, if you've always been in goal, you know if if a player's always been on goal and never, it's, it's actually curious. Edison, I think, was was a striker. If, if I'm not mistaken, or a midfielder when he was younger. And, um, you know, at the age of 10, we're not too sure how players are going to grow either. So just sticking the same boy in goal, which if he wants to be a goalkeeper, it's, it's, it's fine, you know. But if, if, if he's able to, to participate in little tasks and little drills that we do or small sided games outside in the field or make goalkeepers, you know, a part of, I always like little 3v3 situations where, um, the goalkeeper is a part of the attack, so he can shoot. You know, he can he can take part in that in that process of scoring, and also in that process of kind of like defending the goal, just both sides of the game, rather than always just you know using his hands or or catching the ball or trying to save the ball. You know, you give the two perspectives to him. Yeah, and I give a a view on that in terms of having gone on tour to you know, particularly Germany and Holland. They, they over the the, the winter seasons. It isn't just futsal base, it's indoor 4v4, 5v5 in a small court where the goalie is at a distance where he can probably have possession 
as much, if not more, than everybody else in terms of recycling play, filling the ball, playing a sweeper. But then, like you say, they're in a distance in which they might shift it. The team expands and he shoots down the middle. Um, and that might be something that certain countries have in their, their syllabus and their, 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 well, their approach to the season in a youth development stage where the players get the opportunity to, to experience that. Um, so one thing I've noticed that. here, I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of two players on this pitch in Yaya Torre and, and Kante. And you've seen predominantly from Kante since he left Leicester and went to Chelsea and played on the Sarri. But the sheer try to play forwards, whether that be running or passing with the ball, both those players get it and just want to go forwards. Um, so whether that be breaking lines or just driving with the ball, their sheer enthusiasm is, I want to go towards the goal. Now that might be less this case in terms of a breakaway than Kante feeds it through to somebody. And Yaya is probably more an absolute dominant figure who might be, again, a big kid at under 10s who's able to be a powerhouse and run through people. And um, just something I've noticed in the first 10 minutes of this game, really. It's funny. It's funny because from a from a Spanish perspective, it's kind of like the opposite. Here they get them to pass a lot sideways, backwards, and maintain and conserve possession. While obviously training maybe um, in other areas with English kids, I find that it's very dribble orientated. Uh, take players on, get a shot away. Um, you know, cross it straight into the box. Be very you know goal orientated more than conservative um, with the ball. So instead of thinking first about not losing it, we think first, can we score? Now, which is a positive mentality and attacking mentality. But I just think it's, it's, it's curious to see, you know, in the coaching here is very, you know, is very demanding on not losing the ball and um, where you lose the ball or where you, um, you, can, you can take the ball, but, you know, at your own pace, at your own time, make sure it's a good pass, make sure there's quality in everything we do in the build-up. Whereas in the UK or, or the kids that have coached from the UK, it's very, you know, can we get it forward? Can we get it to the striker? Can we get it to, to the players that front to score? Perhaps, yeah. I, think, I, I definitely agree in terms of, I can imagine and what I've seen from a Spanish perspective, you know, the ability to, to master the ball, pass the ball, almost a Johan Cruyff effect coming from Holland into Spain, which... See Barcelona are big advocates for, but I think one thing I wouldn't say it was very much under tens go forwards get forwards. I think it's you've gone through a stage where some of coaches or academies have, have been quite ego based in terms of you know, I want my team to to tick attack and pass it around. I think where I probably first saw it was probably around six years ago now, maybe seven. It was all about giving a 10-year-old a ball, go and show what you can do. And if it can be forwards, brilliant. You know, can it be a step over, a Maradona turn, or even a shot from distance? Can you contribute to the game in an attacking essence? Because you're in the fundamental age group where you get to master the ball, move your body, learn disguises. Later on, it will come of that. It's a very much a how environment. As later on, it will come into more you know, when, where, all scenario based. Obviously, if you're at the latter end of your your learning journey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm. To be honest with you, saying that, um, I'm not a defensive. I'm not a defender of the, of the Spanish way being the better way, or the Holland way, or, or or the English way. It's more so what what I see to be a common trade between coaching and the intense, um, probably behind. A lot of the players coming from different backgrounds and different areas, and obviously at the end of the day, having the ball at my feet, um, I want to get as many touches as I possibly can. Dads can be a huge influence as well. You know, saying if you get so many, so many goals today, I'll get you an ice cream and all this you know, shit that they um, deal out to their kids um, to make them, um, you know, try their best. They don't understand the harm they're doing them in the long term, but you know, that's another, that's another conversation um, for another day. Helado. Helado, helado. So, so yeah, but this, I think like the Spanish players lack um, creativity when they get older because, you know, they're into a safe, they're brought up in such a safety environment with the ball. You mean keep the ball, keep the ball, keep the ball. 
that you you're not able to um, develop you know attributes in the game that can get you out of a situation by beating one two or three or four players and you need to have tried that many 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 times for it to actually happen um, on a regular basis and to be successful I mean, you know, and a lot of times mind. players beat one beat two and they go and beat the third one and we don't recognize that they're beating the first two which is really really good you know and it was a good way to get out of that situation there might have been an easy option but he didn't go for it and he lost the ball in the third player but he, was, he managed to beat one and two players. And if we decide to criticize that, then we won't ever have any more players that are able to beat one, two, three players. We'll yeah, just have the typical players that knock it off. Um, you know, the, the players that just, you know, 10 year olds that you see just knocking it off, they knocking it to safety, which at the end of the day, I, I don't remember you when you were 10, but you know, taking players on is one of the best things. Yeah, and that's, that's what I mean in terms of, forward thinking, you know, Yaya Torre sort of, I want to go and I'm going to try and beat you as much as possible. I mean, it's interesting you said that, though, about the Spanish in terms of when they get older, they might lose creativity. At the time you said that, David Silva got the ball and, and had a shot. Now, David Silva is obviously an extremely spectacular attacking player. So if you're saying, at, you know, from a starting base of a 10-year-old to then later on, it's very passy and can we keep the ball, you know, cherish the ball in another term. What is the divide between the player that is, I need to keep it, or the player like David Silva that goes, I'll keep it, but then if I don't need to keep it, I'm going to go and create you know, a turn, a, a flick, a dummy, or a breaking line pass rather than just a keeping the ball pass. What's the difference in terms of how in Spain have they got the divide of those two types of players? Well, I think it, it highly depends on the environment. I mean, you said something before, and I, I talked to this topic the other day, and on a conversation we were having, which is futsal. Um, futsal in, in Spain is, is a big, big game, and a lot of players start off their playing careers, as they say, or their youth development in futsal, and they play for the first five years. Funny enough, I played the first three years um, in futsal because that was the way you played. You played five a side, which I think... It's a shame that there isn't more of. Now they're playing, you know, when we started playing, which is probably David Silva's era. I mean, he might be one or two years older than me. Uh, yeah, I think he's one or two years older. In that area, you, you got brought up playing five-a-side on dirt pitches, you know. Five-a-side on dirt pitches or five-a-side on indoor pitches where the ball was a lot smaller, it was harder. You could develop a lot of 1v1 scenarios where... You know, continuous, you had continuous scenarios where you had to beat a player and then you had an overload. And then you could all get a shot away, take another player on, pass it and, and get a shot away. You know, it's a lot of um, end zone type of scenarios and also, you know, high intensity in, in defense as well. Which I think nowadays what's happening, especially from this point of view from in Spain, we've got seven aside and nine aside, you know, eight aside and nine aside in under sevens, under eights, under nines, under tens. So the participation level is probably dropped to a quarter and the amount of scenarios that they get in per game is um, dropped probably to a quarter as well. Mm. So what's happened, what's happened with, 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 with Spain? I mean, we see that there's, the, they've lost something in their identity. Players like Iniesta, players like Xavi Hernandez, players like even Busquets, um, which, okay, Busquets is, is, is probably the less riskiest, the risky player of the three. But even David Silva, you know, those players are getting old and we're not getting the youth coming through that have the ability to deal with scenarios and attack deal. I mean, Spain has never been a good attacking, um, let's just say goal scoring from a nine, 11 and seven point of view. A lot of their goals come from set pieces. A lot of their goals come from the number 10. A lot of the goals come from midfielders. You know, um, David Silva was, was tremendous, but David Silva as well, he could beat a player. You know, he could beat a player, he could take players on, he was good receiving the ball on the wing and cut, cutting in, going past the goalkeeper, which right now, Spain haven't got that player. And I think it's down to now we're playing a lot of football and not enough small sided games. Yeah, no, it's interesting that. It's interesting. Um... One thing I noticed here, which you know, is, it can lead into that a little bit, is 
it's very rare, but you're seeing players every now and then like Yaya Torre, Fabian Delph, are make, losing the ball. So in terms of under 10s, how would you consider the best way to, to help the boys do that or come through that? I think it's important like under 10s to like run their base drills are really important. Um, but, you know, I think what a lot of coaches get confused on is run no, it's just a 4v2 or run no, it's just an 8v2. There's a lot of forms of run down, And I think, like, to be able to understand how to keep the ball in a 3v3 scenario, you need to first understand how to keep the ball when you're 6v3. And when you're 6v4, then when you're 6v5, and then when you're 6v6. So when you do have the advantage, you're able to... To, to have that free player always, so there's not really an excuse. So you always have the ability easily to find a way out. And then moving forward, obviously it gets more difficult because it would depend on the player's movement that's, that's around you when we go into equal numbers. But I think in under 10s, they should do a lot with um, extra players and floaters. Basically, just to get the players comfortable with finding the free player, because there always is a free player. And then obviously, as it gets easier for those players if it's like I would even start with four floaters you know what I mean let's play a game where it's a 2v2 you know and every single time it's it's an overload with it's a 5v1 or 5v2 sorry so we're consistently in scenarios where you've got a huge advantage now if you can't score in those situations first how are we going to move on to you know 5v5 if we can't score in a 5v2 so I think simplifying at the beginning is, is key. Um, and obviously the run no base drills don't, you know, you can add goals in run no base drills. You can add um, dribbling zones. You can add a lot of, um, you can adjust the drill for the run no to be a lot more exciting than just, you know, keep the ball 8v2 or keep the ball 7v, um, 7v1. There's a lot of conditions you can give the game. And another thing is, the amount of rondos that are, are made two touch. Make the rondo three touches. Not three, but three, like non limited. I mean, because, why? Because what we're telling the players is you've always got to move the ball. Well, you don't always have to move the ball. You know, there are situations in the game where you do need to drag the defenders towards you because they're defending the space that's, that's further away from the ball. So, yeah, I understand why we use two touch rondos, one touch rondos, maybe three touch rondos. But unlimited touches in run, those are also very, very useful for players that are just beginning because they need to understand when they can take two, three, four, four, five touches and when they can't. And if you don't, you lose it and you go in the middle. So giving them the freedom to learn is, 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 is probably, I would say, before going into that you know, end goal, which might be a quick run though where you're moving the ball around quite quickly, is... Are we able to develop players that first understand the game when, you know, the things around them are in an easy context before making it complicated? What about yourself? For me, I completely agree in terms of the touches. I think it's good to expose them to challenges, but then also to understanding the next step in terms of, so if you were to say one or two, I would then want my players to recognise, well, if I've got time, I could probably take a touch, draw the defender in, assess the situation, then shift it on. If the defender's near me or the previous player took a touch and he's two touches and the defender's in my corner of the area, time to shift it quickly or get my body in the way. Um, one major thing, and I mean major for me, which I don't think you mentioned, was I think there is a flaw in the rondo where, for me, it needs to be directional. Um, and recognising mm -hmm. my intent is to play forward um, and then without forcing too much pressure on the players, recognise when you can play forward to, to, to potentially take that, that opportunity. Um, so that could be, can you number your players in the rondo or can you have a target player beyond the rondo and get yourself through the box and back through the box continuously recognising when I can play forwards, I will. When I can't, I'll play sideways. If I can't play sideways, I'll play back and then assess the picture off the next man that has possession. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to you know, the use of the players losing the ball, I would love my players to continuously lose the ball because they learn as much about losing it 
recognise, OK, well, I lost it in that situation. I'm not going to discourage them to lose the ball, but I am going to encourage them to be deep in their learning of the situation. Why did you lose the ball there? OK, well, I didn't check my shoulder. Brilliant. OK, or my first touch let me down. OK, why did your first touch let you down? Oh, you hit it really hard. Okay, Can you, you know, be lighter on your feet next time? Just relax your foot as it comes into you. Give it a go. You know, I want them to, to learn through mistakes as well as you know, being the... Uh, you know, the young player who can can do this and can do that. I want them to be able to like so Yaya Torre there played it at the outside of his foot. He tried it, recognised all Brighton's recovery. And next time he gets it, he might look for all Brighton before he plays that pass, for example. Um, mm -hmm. No, interesting. I mean, this game's not particularly had many set pieces, um, but you know, I consider throw-ins, goal kicks like smart. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned throw-ins before we started this video, like. And I, and I think it's, it's key, like even the basics, like a kickoff, a goal kick, throw in, you know, just run me through what your thoughts are on these. Should we, should we, should they be coached? Should they be given importance at the age of under 10? It's interesting. I imagine most young, young, like we're talking seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year olds, the coaches probably don't really think about it much until it's in a game and, the, you know, they've got a corner, right? Um, what do we do? Or... You know, we've got a throw-in. We don't probably even consider throw-ins valuable, but yet the frequency they occur where players kick the ball off the pitch under 10 loads is very high. You know, if you were to get statistics, I imagine it goes out a lot. So there would be a reason to do it. I, I would prioritise just general ball play, let the kids learn the game, play the game, feel the game, go through the emotions more than set pieces. But it would be something yeah. that maybe go right in the changing room while they're waiting for the boys to arrive. Okay, the first two players in the room today are your captains. You're in charge of a set piece. Can you create one on the wall quickly of a whiteboard and the, and the magnets? And, so, and then, you know, he might come up with, oh, we're going to do a short corner today. And for me, I think that's where as a coach, you've got, you stand back and go, give it a try. You know, and then at the end of the day, you might assess it and go, did it work? Ah, oh, well, it didn't work. It worked the first time, but they... They, worked, they found out what we were doing the second time. So next week, we're going to do it the first time. And the second time, we're going to do something different. Brilliant. So they're deep into the set pieces without being guided too much. And it, again, it's a trial and error opportunity for them to, to, to learn how they do it. Um, that's it for me. I mean, if you're to go in the nitty degree to details, I think... It's stop start in terms of the game. So for throw ins, I'd, or, I'd give challenges as much as freedom. I'd say, right, when you throw the ball, can you throw it to his feet? Um, why would we do that? You know, again, they have to consider why. Okay, well, it's easy. Yeah, it's, that's crazy, though. It's crazy the amount of kids that just throw the ball to somebody's head. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, well, I, I probably, the thing is, I probably did it as well, you know, but it's. It's just curious how, you know, simple, simple things are that we might not even consider or we consider to be logical because obviously we're in a, um, from a different angle. But it's important to just, you know, point them out to the kids, you know? Yeah, and I think that's, that's a great way of explaining. You're pointing it out and just, you know, making them aware because you're meant to be not the expert, but the, the man that's guiding them to where they, they want to learn and develop. So if you can identify a throw in and say, right, he's going to receive it better as your teammate. How can you get it to him so it's easier for him? You know, encourage him to throw it to his feet. Or a corner, you know, kids football, the likelihood of unless you've got a real target man, and I'm not encouraging you to find the target man, but you could be using a strength, you know, lumping the ball into a crowded area. You probably wouldn't encourage that with your boys anywhere else on the pitch. So why would you do it on a set piece? And it's just a matter of making when everybody's When everybody's prepared for it. <laughs> Even more so, yeah, they're static, the ball's static, they can all see it. Um, interesting. You know, it's I, I, really I, taking advantage. To me, it's can I take an advantage of them having an error? You know, because they're on the tens, the goalkeeper might be, um, you know, at the, end, at the age of under 10, ball's coming into the box, it could come off somebody and go into the net. It can, you know, the goalkeeper can put it in his own net, it can hit somebody and, and then go in. But really, is that what we want to be teaching, you know? Is that really developing the player to, to, to kick the ball? This is something that I see as well. You know, you, you, you get a lot of free kick take, takers and corner takers and, and stuff like that at the age of 10. And you're thinking, well, how are, how are the other 10s going to develop their kicking 
if they don't ever get a chance. You know what I mean? Of course he knows how to kick it because he gets 100 kicks a season. Whereas, you know, another, another player who's, you know, maybe weaker in that area because he doesn't have that opportunity to practice. Well, yeah, okay, I'll take that back. He probably does have that opportunity to practice with his dad in the park and whatnot. I'm not going to take that away. But, you know, at the end of the day, it can't just be Jimmy because he takes a good corner and we get goals out of it because it comes off people. It goes in the back of the net because uh, year after year, that's not going to make him a better player. And he that's will continue to do it. Yeah, and with, with that in this, mind, like, this is the thing. Your, your why has to, has to be considered there. So if your little Jimmy is the man that scored goals and you're like trying to win games, you know, are you doing it for the right reasons? Yes, I do think there's an area to consider winning at, on the tens, just on the basis that they, they learn to win and lose and want to, want to have that passion. Probably not win-driven at all, development-driven. But um, And interestingly, like, like you said, in terms of getting everybody to have a go, one of my previous clubs I worked at, it was captains each week changed. And each week, no matter the scenario, that captain was on penalties. So, you know, you go a week as a captain, you don't get a penalty, but you get, you, you become a week of, we've got a penalty, right, who's taking it? Oh, who's captain today? And, you know, they, they've been thrown in that responsibility stage as a skipper and as, you know, set piece taker, just, you know, on a, on a roll of the dice, really, because you can't predict when that's going to happen. Um, without changing the subject too much, because it does link, just in that, that last far three, four minute period, Leicester had three throw-ins in Man City's attacking half. Twice, the ball got lost off a throw-in. Now, for me, a bit like the corners, that Leicester committed so many numbers forward, which is rare in this game because they're obviously playing more a low block, but you know, not valuing their throw, losing it, and then being on the back foot. And when I took one of my first academy uh, under nine or ten teams, I probably was at the time. I used to say to the boys, "Oh, on corners, you know, you don't have to come back. Stay where, go wherever you want to go on the pitch." And my like, my justification behind it was, if they're going to lump the ball in the box, and I've got three players in the halfway line ready to attack, not to score a goal because you know the the ball's been given to us, you know. So as soon as we get it, right now we're in transition on the counter attack because the other team have thrown bodies forward. They're not cherished possession. Um, just, just it reminded me of an experience watching it here, and even Cassius Michael just then locking everybody up the pitch. Um, you know, the reasons behind it might be different now. They're out of possession, just to get around the throw in and look, force a mistake. You know, Vardy forcing it backwards there, or, or, or Brighton, sorry. Oh, totally. I think positioning, like as you said as well, like insert pieces, insert pieces, and in play. One, one topic that always, you know, astounds me is players hover around the ball and they don't understand space. They don't normally have much space awareness and that's, that's normal, you know? It's common because at the end of the day, we want to be involved and we want to kick the ball and we want to um, try to take part as, 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 for as long as we possibly can for as many um, times during the game as we possibly can. But at the end of the day, what we are trying to accomplish um, is can we get players to understand where they should be in each one of the scenarios, you know? And that goes through, as you said before, sometimes I need, a, I need to be in every wrong place on the pitch to understand where I need to be in the right place. Mm, definitely. So I need that process and that process is my development. You know, I need to be in every inch of the pitch and probably nine times out of 10, I'll probably be in the wrong position, but that's part of the growth. That's part of the development. And you taking away that, is, I always recall um, my father telling me, like I had, because I used to play centre-back, not because of my height, <laughs> but I used to play centre-back and he used to shout, you got him behind, he's behind you, son, he's behind you. So I would, you know, check the shoulder, pick him up, and they probably didn't score. What he, he didn't realise is, I would never realise to check my shoulder on my own because there was never an issue, there was never an error. We only ever look at what we did when there's a clear error behind it. So if that guy or number nine got behind me, received the ball and scored, and my team would have lost the league, I probably would never ever forget after that to check my shoulder. 
definitely. No, definitely. And I think, there you go, learning through error and trial and error and making mistakes can be just as beneficial as being capable of doing a skill or an understanding. Um, just on there, it was quite interesting, 10 seconds ago, it came up on the top-hand corner, uh, Man City pass success, 89%. And just 30 seconds before that, uh, Collar uh, off at uh, left back, who mm -hmm. is easily considered a very technical, skilled left back, has blazed across 30 yards away from the goal, out for a goal kick. And I've always, you know, I've, one of my close friends who we discussed, be like yourself, football a lot, is how, how often can you be critical of a 10-year-old for kicking the ball out or making an error when Kolarov, I'm making this up, but he could be on 100 grand a week at this point and he's making the same mistake. So if you can see where I'm exactly. coming from in terms of there's very few in the world, if any, who, who don't make mistakes and you have to be careful in terms of criticising or holding against them because we're all human. I do, I do believe, and I'm, I'm not going to go against what you're saying, but I do believe it's important for people to realise when they have made mistakes. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I do agree with that. I think what we, what, what we can do is sugarcoat a lot of things which shouldn't be sugarcoated. And what I mean by that is when something's, you know, a mistake, when something's um, not gone right or when something's, you know, something that, we, that isn't helping the team or isn't helping, okay, it's a mistake. You can decide to do it again and not do it again. But, you know, losing the ball isn't a good thing for the team and that needs to be told and, and, and the player needs to understand that it's not, ah, oh, it's okay, go, you can do it again. You know, you're just learning. It gets to a point in your development where if Timmy or Jimmy, we said before, beats two players and loses it against the third, he does it once, okay, no worries. He does it a second time, you might, you know, let him know. But if he does it again a third time, it's really a difference between I'm trying something and two, I'm not learning from my mistake. So it needs to be told. Yeah, and no, I, I, something. I was waiting for you to go three because a coach I work with now, he he just he's always worked off a free uh, free strike rule. Um, that reflects to discipline, technical, tactical, set pieces. It's like look, okay, like you said, you know, you lose the ball once, it happens. Lose it twice, I'm starting to think, okay, what? Why are you losing it there? What's the issue? Lose the ball the third time, right? Maybe this is a point where I may, might intervene and go, A, the standards need to be higher, or B, can I help you? You know, in terms of, oh, well, I'm struggling with my left foot, right? Try it, try it on your left foot, you know, and that's where the coaching comes in as much as the learning and the experience. You've got a balance there, haven't you, like you said? Oh, totally balanced. And, and, and a lot of people jump in on the first, on the first and the second. And what they do is they create the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth because they make that player nervous, they make that player confused, um, or they, they, you know, they, they're over-coaching the player in every single decision that he's made. And then he's a, he's, what you're stalling is fear. Yeah. You know? and, and another thing is, you know, there's, there's something that I really appreciate from, I think it was Southampton Academy that came over to a tournament here. And they only ever talked to the kids from a sitting down position they never, you know, got up and barked instructions because I think they just understood, you know, the kids are going to give it their best and, you know, we're going to sit down at half time. we're going to go through things and, you know, we've done this three times and why is it happening? I mean, even, it's funny, I mean, it's funny the relationship, I'm going to bring this now, but I was watching The Godfather yesterday, okay, and obviously it's a completely different topic, but, you know, I... I you come to think that how much you listen to him when he's talking and he never raises his voice. Mm. It's more so what he says, how he says it, and when he says it, more than what he's saying. Meaning, no, what he's saying, no, when he's saying it. So a coach can easily, you know, bark out instructions and that same message you could say in, you know, after the game, sitting down or with that player individually and make a huge difference in impact. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you mentioned the, the observing as such, 
is a terminology I came across a few years ago, which was called skillful silence, where mm -hmm. you intentionally shut your mouth off and you solely focus on your eyes and your ears and take in as much information as possible. Because naturally, when football's an emotional sport, you, know, you get drawn into it. Um, you, you've got incentives to help the players in front of you. Naturally, you, you tend to switch off one of your senses sometimes and you, you're solely focused on, I need to help him, I need to help him. And actually, just step back. You, you take a different perspective. You might take a little bit more information. Not saying religiously doing it, but it's just another added skill coaches can add at a 10-year-old level to understand. You, know, you might even be so caught up in it take a moment to be silent, look at all the parents and think, oh, maybe they're a bit too involved. Maybe that might be something I, that's affecting the player's ability to execute a skill. Um, mm -hmm. So no, it's interesting that. And uh, it's quite interesting. If I were using the isolation period right now, I sent out, I'm sending out weekly challenges to my players to, to watch games, physical, technical. You know, some are doing it, some aren't. It's, it's up to them, optional. But one of the things I did this week was which type of coach do you prefer on the sideline in the Premier League? Now, what they didn't realise, I was doing this for my benefit in terms of I put recent Premier League managers, so I use different personality traits. Conte being the man who's always with them. Mourinho being probably more the sit back and, you know, he's emotional in terms of the game, but he's understanding tactically and technically is, is incredible and he sits there quite calm and calm, um, collective. And then you've got Jurgen Klopp, very emotional and, and powerly with them. And really interesting to see my players, they're a bit older than 10, they're 14, 15, 16, but certain players want a Conte, certain players want a Klopp, you know, and they're different attributes from each. Um, the one size doesn't fit. Emotion, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of them, I think, are emotionally dependent. I think we're bringing up a large number of emotionally dependent human beings right now. And it's down to parenting um, more so than anything else. I think that their emotions and their self-awareness in kids nowadays is very, very low because we continuously tell them. And one big example with it is it's kind of like there's no reward for what they're doing or no kind of punishment. Everything just flows. And the example I, I found was when um, a, a friend of mine told his son, what would you like for dessert? And I was just thinking, it never used to be like that. You know, the parent didn't ask you, what would you like for dessert? You used to ask if you could have dessert. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. You know, so what happens now is, is I think because a lot of parents of the generation, you know, the 40s, 50s, they went through quite a lot of shit, you know, when they were younger. They don't want their kids to go through the same shit. But what they don't realize is, that shit made you who you are today. And that shit made you have a lot of the good things that you currently have as a parent, you know? And taking that away, you know, taking a kid away the possibility to fall over takes away the possibility for him to pick himself up. Interesting. You know what I mean? I like the, I like the, the little terminology as well, the dessert. I thought it's quite a good metaphor. I like that. <laughs> Um, just a quick one, we've, well, now we're getting towards the end of this half. Um, we haven't mentioned it in terms of under 10s, where very clear we've got Leicester here uh, applying their tactic, which has been very strong throughout the season. Um, you know, young academies might have philosophies or styles of play they're expected to play, or they might have the freedom to apply what they want. Man City, obviously, a whole different character now under Pep, but... Pe uh, Pellegrini is still a very technical and tactical manager. What extent would you go and how, how much would you want tactically to be coached to an under 10 age group? I think it's how, how much you can, you, this is goes into how, I think this really goes, goes into how, I wouldn't say clever you are as a coach, but how much experience you've had as a coach. And I'll try and explain this um, in a way that, easy, not easy to understand, but kind of like um, dissolvable. So, like just what we're doing now, we can go into a group of tens, okay, and probably explain what control possession is for a group of under 10. Meaning, for example, the first thing we need to work on is our positioning on the pitch, okay, which 
they wouldn't start, this professional team is not going to start with positions they are on the pitch. They understand that width and depth create space. Well, that's something that you need to go for in a month, you know, with a group of under 10. Every single training session, every single match, you're just going to work on when you get the ball back, what's your width like, what's your depth like. What happens with, I think, with grassroots coaches that are just beginning, young coaches that are really enthusiastic, have the right mentality, but they don't have enough patience. Yeah. Where they'll start with width and depth, but after a week, they'll start without knowing exactly if they've got to success or good understanding of that width or depth, which I can tell you now, a group of under 10s will probably take between maybe one and six months to understand really what width and depth is, okay? And some of them won't until they're maybe 14. But just that patience in what are we really trying to get out of this nine months, you know? What are the good, good objectives for a group of under 10s to get, I understand tactically. And I think a group of under 10s, just to know where to be on the pitch and how to be on the pitch positionally when we attack and where to be on the pitch when we don't have the ball or what we need to do when we don't have the ball and what we need to do when we get the ball back in very, very simple terms, okay, would kind of cover as far as I would probably go with a tactical approach. What about yourself? I mean, for me... Um, I think you have to initially consider the context your players are in in terms of are they grassroots, are they a development centre, are they an academy in terms of the detail you give. I think there is a leeway to give extended detail to, to either more technically skilled kids or brighter kids. The other thing, I would still keep it simple. So in terms of when the emotions of the game come in, they can still apply it. For me, a lot of my tactical considerations would be done through challenges. Now, that would be, mm -hmm. if I was to use a defensive one, looking at Leicester here, when the ball is ahead of us, can we compress the pitch higher up and join the attack? When the ball is behind us, can we all get goal side in terms of educating them on recovery runs? Or I might put a, a line of cones through the middle of the pitch in a, a small-sided game of training, go, right, when the ball's on the left side, can the defensive team all get over to the left side and the centre of the pitch, you know, in terms of making the pitch compact? A bit like technical challenges, I'd probably keep it to one focus. So tactically today, in possession, can we look to play forwards? And then that's where they then are exposed to technical challenges as well. But then ta uh, tactically defensively, again, one focus challenge. Are you able to support the man closest to the ball? And, and they'll be different players who can apply it to different levels, like you said, in terms of their ability. It might be one month, it might be six months, and that's when you add the next detail. Um, they're never, you know, you've got first-team players in this match here who might not follow the tactics as well as the manager would hope. Um, and that's where, as with young, young players at 10 years old, you can't be too expectant for them to, to really know what they're doing all the time. Um, just exposing them to the challenges, giving them. Some I think it's more 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 important as well. I know we're trying to go into tactical, but like it, it it wouldn't be one of my main worries at the beginning. If if I'm just thinking about the coach that could be, you know, actually in the situation that is with a group of under tens. Obviously, I think the academy coaches they've got a bit more backup. I would say, or a bit more, a few more people around them, and probably. Um, you know, a lead phase development coach or whatever that's above them that gives them a lot of what they need to work on. I'm just thinking about the coaches that might be going out, you know, um, as a volunteer or, you know, helping a group of under 10s or a dad that might be, or a parent that might be, you know, helping out on a weekend, doing one or two training sessions a week and whatnot. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's more important than football or any sport is kind of like just the, the, the basic discipline, the environment, how the kids treat each other, um, how you, you know, deal with the kids, how much, you know, fun they have out of the sessions. It's, it's so much more important because, you know, when they get to 14, 15, they're going to have that, um, I would say, they're going to have that, oh, what's the word, Harry? You said you think you just... Expectation? Yeah, well, they're going to have that expectation. They're going to have, 
they're going to have that coach that's a little bit more in depth with each area. Let him deal with it. This is what I mean. Kind of like a group of under 10s, you know, it's probably one of their best memories when, when, you, when you're growing up in football. You're just probably going to leave the seven aside, nine aside game. At the end of the day, I think it's more important to move on with, you know, a good understanding of values, good understanding of respect, good understanding of discipline, good understanding of, of you know, what it's like to lose, what it's like to win, it's the importance of each area of the game, how the game's actually, you know, works, what, how, to, how to actually dominate, what a goal kick, a throw-in, if I take throw-ins and a right left back, like the simple, the basics of every single area, like marginal games from a basic point of view. Like create a good... Um, foundation. Yeah, a good foundation, that's the word. A good foundation. No, it's interesting. I mean, another, just while we're start touching on that, I think you've got to get the foundations right, but another tactic I've used with under 10s is uh, just internal competition, you know? Today, who can win the ball back the most? You know, the, the boys are now enthusiastic to go and regain possession without being forced or, you know, or, you know, players might not want to win the ball back. Now, there might not be a prize, but that's where the players have got to develop that, that winning mentality without it being fully reliant on result-based. It's more, I am developing my ability to go and press the ball. And that little carrot that's dangling down is, I want to beat my teammate and, and say I won today, because every child wants to do that. Um, no, really good, Harry. I think the, the, thing with, the thing with challenges, though, and this is the issue I have with them, is I find it very difficult to keep the score when I, you know, the more complex I make it, yeah. the more difficult it is indeed to, to, to keep the score of the game. And I do believe, even though obviously it's not important the result, it is important. You know, it is important that you do your bit, which is if you are managing the, the session and you give me a challenge, if I'm able to do that challenge, you're able to kind of like reward me the what you decided you know don't lose that credibility of becoming the coach that you know sets challenges because it'll get to a point where you'll set a challenge and they'll be like yeah well i know sometimes you count it sometimes you don't so yeah no, no you know, right you're right you are right i mean just one i'm not disagreeing with it whatsoever um because i have been guilty of setting a challenge then never following through with it which i think you know is where you create that uh, you, the players lose the interest. What a great goal by Mahrez, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I was, one thing I've done, again, just an idea with under 10s, was you, not all players can play. So can you engage those on the sideline? You know, in terms of having a substitute, you've got a tactics board behind you right there, right? Okay, little Harry, you're off for the next five minutes, okay? I'm going to help you. We're going to see who wins the ball back the most. Let's use that example. Um, just a little tally chart. Exactly, delegate. I love that. And uh, just making everybody all involved, including those that aren't off the on the pitch. Um, so yeah, no, there's some fantastic points there in terms of technical. Let's try and tactical. conclude. Let's try and make this a conclusion. So, you tell me three things that you think are probably the most important three things that you out of this whole conversation. Let's try and bring it to a conclusion, an end conclusion. So, three things that you believe or really important that you would do with your under 10s group? Okay, I'm going to write it down before I say it. So we'll I'll start you off. Go on in. I'll start you. I think, I think it, the, the team, I'll, I'm not going to call it team cohesion because I don't think they're old enough for it to be called that. But I think the environment that you're doing every one of your training sessions in, I think you need to pay attention to every detail in that environment for it to be a healthy environment and not allow any type or kind of you know um as as the as the all blacks say no dickheads you know kind of like avoid that being rewarded in any way that's definitely my number one environment number two i would say you know patience I would definitely go with patience for, for coaches that are just starting and don't put too much pressure on yourself to get success. Really evaluate what success is for you. Remember that winning is a reason to play the game, but it's not the all end 
of, of why you're doing or becoming a coach. Um, and they need to learn and you need to try and help them digest what losing is and help them digest what drawing is and help them as well digest the fact that winning isn't everything and there's a lot of negatives in winning and there's a lot of positives in losing. So I think that that is key uh, at a young age to to kind of understand or at least, you know, I hate losing, yeah, cool, but, you know, here's some positives as well. You know, there's some positives from that game that we lost and don't just, don't just go negative with negative or positive with positive. And then third, I would say, you know, ask a lot of people that are around you for their opinion. I think that asking other coaches to come and watch your session, asking or getting in touch with, with other coaches to just um, have conversations based or around topics that worry you and don't be afraid of, of talking about your mistakes or even asking that question to yourself before asking the question to the coach. So everything is, is your fault. Everything that happens in the training session, everything that happens after a game is your fault. At the same time as, you know, don't put, I'm saying it's your fault, take it in that way to self-reflect and to get to know yourself and to get to know yourself as a coach. Don't take it in the sense of, you know, get depressed, everything's my fault and all that. That's not the idea behind it. So I would just say, like, try and build your self-awareness as a coach from the start by asking questions to yourself and questions to others. So there will be my three. What about yourself? I mean, you've gone very, in terms of what the coach and their, their self. So I initially wrote down environment as well as one. Uh, I've manipulated mine a little bit to be just for something them to consider during training and during gameplay. And the three I've wrote, wrote down are, first one is the players are going to make mistakes. It helps them. Um, don't expect perfection because it doesn't exist. Uh, and that is the same for coaches. We make mistakes in terms of session design and some information we give to players. And you have to lean in on your point, reflect on when things go well, what could be done better. Uh, in terms of session design, I encourage players to learn through playing the game and you know, setting up practices where they play lots of games at under 10 years old. But you can manipulate it to create scenarios, whether it be a scoreline based, if that's what their incentive is, we're losing 3-0 or there's a goal difference or there's a way goal rule, things like that for enjoyment and to, to grasp their interest. But then also technical challenges, like we said with the rondos, uh, touches or areas of the pitch, you can try and do this or can you force them one way? Just little challenges for me. Um, and then last but not least, from a coaching and the, what the players receive is they enjoy it. But with an incentive, uh, a taste of reality as well. You know, when things need to be said, they are said. Um, and when things are going well or going poorly, they're still understood that the main reason players are there and the coaches are there and their families are a lot of expectating is just because they love the sport. And if you can continue to, to force that upon a player, they'll continue to play, they'll double their engagement hours and they'll probably double their talent and capabilities. Um, so I'd really encourage, make mistakes, learn through play, and everybody enjoys but has a taste of reality while on the journey.